Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon from different parts of the world, wherever you're joining in. We welcome everybody here. Thank you for joining in in today's uh, webinar session. We'll give it another minute, and then uh, we'll, we'll start with the agenda here. Let's see. Uh, Go back here. We have an amazing audience today, um, along with an amazing speaker here. So really looking forward to today's webinar. I see we have a lot of fans of Nathan here. Yeah, Yvonne is... Uh, Awesome. So we'll we'll kick start here with some uh, housekeeping and logistics item here. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, uh, just the housekeeping items to start with uh, for today's webinar. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please put your questions in the question box. We will moderate those questions at the end. Uh, we will be uh, recording the session, so you will have an access to this recording of the webinar. Uh, it will be available after a week uh, or so. If you, uh, uh, if you have uh, a specific questions that we cannot answer today, we will be responding over a blog form or an email at the, uh, after a week. Uh, so please do engage. Uh, with that said, uh, since there is a, uh, quite a bit of audience is already here, uh, we will begin the sh uh, session for today. Uh, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'll be moderating today's session, uh, and our speaker for today is uh, Nathan Rouse. Uh, my name is Ravi Sahu. For those who don't know, uh, I work at Estreos, uh, and Estreos is uh, a software company where we develop uh, uh, mind to mill AI solutions, starting from uh, uh, photogrammetry solutions where you can uh, generate 3D model, and then we have solutions for uh, designing the glass, face profiling, uh, then various prediction tools uh, where you can analyze the outcomes of the glass, such as fragmentation, mud pile, or vibration. And then there is a post glass assessment tool for fragmentation analysis, mud pile movement, uh, glass movement analysis. And along with that, uh, there is an optimization and KPI tracking can be built in one platform. Uh, so that's a quick overview of Estreos, uh, what we do. Uh, if you have any specific questions about Estreos, please uh, reach out. We'd love to talk uh, with anybody here. Uh, but uh, the moment we've been waiting for, uh, for today's uh, webinar topic is uh, guidelines for perimeter control and pre-split design. Uh, and in today's uh, webinar, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, interesting content here, you know, which is uh, very new to me. Uh, so I'm certainly looking forward uh, uh, to learn uh, this topic, but not just in terms of the safety side, but there's a lot of uh, operational improvement can be done on the blasting uh, here. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Nathan Rouse. Uh, Nathan, I've known Nathan for uh, quite some time and uh, there is, uh, uh, there's a lot of kind of, you know, knowledge that he has uh, that cannot be summed up in a three lines bio, but I'll do my best here. Um, Nathan Rouse has a Bachelor of Science, ma uh, Master's and PhD from the University of Missouri, Rolla, Missouri Science and Technology. Uh, he has more than 13 years of experience in both surface and underground mines globally. Uh, and I can attest to that, you know, the amount of traveling he does in different parts of the world. Uh, he recently started his own drill and blasting consulting company uh, called Thoroughbred Drill and Blast Consultants, uh, uh, where uh, he's uh, a practitioner uh, of various drill and blast practices. And uh, uh, and in previously, you may have seen in uh, the various companies that he worked where he uh, has played a key role in solving a lot of problems as a consultant. Um, 
So with that, I'll let uh, uh, Nathan take over and introduce uh, the topic for today. Uh, take away, Nathan. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, somebody did ask if this is going to be recorded. Are you recording this? If not, I'm happy to do that. Yes, it is recorded. OK. Uh, good afternoon or good morning or uh, good whatever part of the day it is where wherever uh, you are all calling in from. We have quite a few people, so I, I really appreciate that there's that much interest in this topic. Uh, I know I recognize a few names on there, uh, so it's good to see names that I recognize, but it's good to see a lot of names that I don't recognize, too. Um, you know, for those of you that I don't know, it, hopefully we can meet sometime in the future anyway. Um, but today we'll talk about general guidelines for perimeter control and pre-split design. Uh, and as you can see, I've got the, the kind of the headings of the presentation on the right. So we'll talk about the, we'll do an introduction and then talk about different perimeter control techniques, uh, touch on different external factors that it can impact your perimeter control results, and then kind of summarize everything. Okay, so this is a, this is a new presentation format for me. So I'd be interesting to know at the end if you guys want to put in the comments how you like it. I, I've never done this, this format where, where everything's kind of on the side over here, uh, but hopefully it, it does a good job in this webinar format. So Robbie pretty much covered this uh, about me part. My, my history has been in consulting with a lot of practical applications in the field. And I've worked for a company called Morgan Worldwide Consultants, Respec, which is also a consulting company. I worked for Dino Nobel in their consulting division. And a couple months ago, just started my own business. And my focus is on underground blasting engineering and consulting projects globally. That's not to say that I don't do any surface because I do. Uh, I just, I focus on underground because there are a lot of underground projects out there. And I feel like the resources for those are lacking compared to the surface industry. So Ravi, if you want to throw up the first poll. Yes. Uh, so time for today, uh, a quick poll here. I will release it here. The very first poll. So everybody can take a few seconds to participate. It's live now. Yeah, so it's just a quick poll on uh, just to give me a little understanding of the audience on where you work the most, whether it's underground operations or engineering or surface or, or something else. So it looks like we got mostly service operations. We got some, well, we got a little bit of everything anyway. Okay, we'll uh, take the last five seconds and close it. Let's do some yeah, well, that's still closing. I'll, I'll move on to the objectives. So the objectives today, I, I broke it down into four categories. The first one is to that, that those of you listening, uh, one, that you understand the various perimeter control techniques that are at your uh, disposal, that you have the ability to select which perimeter technique best suits your site, uh, that you're prepared to be aware of factors that affect perimeter control results. So due to the time limit and just the, the breadth of what we could talk about, I don't go into all of the specific details of how to account for the different factors, but we do touch on them just to make sure that you're aware of them. And then finally, know how to adjust design parameters to achieve desired results. So basically, which, which levers can you pull in your design to make adjustments to hopefully get better results if you're not achieving the results that you want? And so let's just talk briefly about the purpose of perimeter control. And I'm using an underground tunnel in this example. So without perimeter control, the, the design is basically heavy loading on the perimeter. And you could, you could imagine this as a surface mine as well, where you just do production blasting and there's no sort of specialty blasts around the perimeter to protect the ending high walls. So the heavy, load, heavy loading causes backbreak and damage into the walls 
around. So this leads to overbreak, high wall stability issues and safety concerns in surface mining, excessive costs and sterilized reserves. And then in underground, you can have overbreak, dilution, loose roof and rib, ex rib excess, uh, rock mechanics and ground control costs and safety concerns as, as well. And so with perimeter control, we can minimize that uh, breakage back into the final wall. And we can do that through a number of, of different levers we can pull. Uh, one, using smaller hole diameters, lighter explosive loading, um, closely spaced holes, so making things a bit smaller scale, and produce a limiting plane for that production blast so it doesn't uh, damage beyond where you want it to, to break. Um, so all of these factors we'll look at in each of the perimeter design techniques that we touch on. So before we get into those, I have two more polls here. Rob, if you want to throw up the second one. Yes, uh, the poll two is active now. So this is just uh, to, to let me know, for those of you listening, what your experience level is with perimeter control. And while you're filling that out, just keep in mind as we're doing this, Again, just the ultimate goal is to protect the final high walls or final roof and rib if you're underground. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, and, and we'll cover most of them anyway, or at least general guidelines for them that, um, you know, in my experience, the perfect rule of thumb might not be able to be followed in an in a operational scenario, but there's ways you can get decent results still. Um, while keeping things practical. So Ravi, it looks like we've got a lot of people that do it every day, a lot have used it a few times and a lot have never used it. So um, kind of a, a mm -hmm. equal mix of all of them, which is good. Do you wanna go ahead and throw up the third poll? Absolutely, yeah. So the third one is almost a continuation to build our on the last question here, it's just active now. A few people say they're having issues with the poll response. Okay, uh, that's, uh, I just added a, a third one. Let's see if uh, anybody, you can just type in the chat as well if you are not able to uh, take the poll. I've noticed on mine, if I click other just to try it, then the vote, it'll, it'll show and then it'll disappear and the vote goes blank. So I'm having that issue too. Hmm. You just gotta be quick, click quick, I guess. <laughs> so it looks like overwhelming majority anyway, or for stability in geotech is the most common reason that we've used perimeter control, which, um, doesn't surprise me. I put reduce haulage costs because sometimes underground, if you can uh, reduce overbreak, then that's less material you have to muck out and haul. So that's that's one reason underground you might have a cost benefit to it. So okay, uh, we'll go ahead and move on then, and we'll talk about the different techniques. So we've got what three seven techniques here. And bolt blasting is not, not really a perimeter control technique. It's more of just a baseline blasting type that, that we do when we're not controlling. So this is kind of setting the stage for what happens with a blast if we don't do perimeter control. Um, so the, the goal of bolt blasting is, is production, right? And fragmentation. So normally not looking at wall control. And the idea is to fire the minimum number of holes required to meet production or development targets. So we're trying to optimize um, production and tonnages while, while keeping fragmentation somewhere that we can dig it. And the, basically blast holes are loaded with bulk explosives to maximize turnaround and efficiency. 
So this is your standard production blast scenario. And I've got kind of an example of an underground production blast. In this case, for those of you who aren't familiar with the underground realm, this would be a, a development pattern for a tunnel. And it's a lot of places called a burn cut. So you would shoot a bunch of holes where that black box is out and it would create a free face for the rest of the holes to shoot to. In this case, there's no special design or product used on the perimeter. So uh, basically what happens is, is this is just for production, right? So minimizing amount of drilling and maximizing uh, productivity. So if we zoom in on a couple of the hole, holes, what happens is we time it is the, as, as we move out towards the perimeter, we fire holes that are fully coupled with both the like bulk explosive and they fracture. And then the next row fractures and then the perimeter fractures. So you get all these fractures into the wall, um, that can cause the overbreak and issues with, with high walls and stability and geotech issues. Uh, this is obviously oversimplified, but it's, it's for illustrative purposes. So that's bulk blasting. Really nothing special to that. The next one is trim blasting. And this is more associated with what you'd see in like a surface mine. And I, I wasn't gonna really touch on this too much, but I wanted to make sure it was covered. So with trim blasting, normally in, in large metal mines, they shoot really large production blasts. When you get close to the perimeter, you'll shoot a narrower blast, maybe four or five rows of holes. And that kind of defines, that's blasted along the, the final high wall. And the idea is that trim blast does a little better job of protecting the high wall than a full production blast would do. So you're trimming off rock, and maybe you pre-split as well before, which we'll get into pre-splitting, but maybe you pre-split uh, at the final perimeter, and then the trim blast is right against the pre-split to protect the pre-split. So you don't want to damage that uh, line where you've done that control. Um, you might want a relatively high powder factor. I know a lot of places that light load the perimeter holes to prevent damage from the pre-split. Um, and the key here is you're limiting the number of rows so that uh, the blast doesn't build against itself and cause damage into the high wall. So the, the, the key here is you have a free face and everything moves towards the free face and it's not over confined. Okay, so here's just kind of a diagram to show what that would look like. So let's say we have our bulk blast or production blast, which is what I talked about last. And then we would have a trim blast uh, right next to the final high wall, which maybe that final high wall line was pre-split. Okay, so those are kind of the more uh, common surface blasting, production blast type of scenarios. And now I can get more into the different perimeter control methods to protect the uh, final high wall. So the first one's line drilling. And in this method, holes are spaced close together and they're not loaded. So they're, they're placed in a line to create a final perimeter. And the idea is that the holes are close enough together that they stop any of the fractures from the production holes from going beyond. I've seen this used a lot in the field. Um, to, to Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And most of the time it doesn't work is because the holes aren't spaced close enough together. So they have to be really closely spaced to prevent the fractures from going much beyond them. Um, the approach here, a good rule of thumb is to drill them at a spacing of two to four times the drill hole diameter. So let's say you're on a construction project and you're drilling three inch or 75 millimeter holes, then those holes need to be like six to 12 inches apart and 12 inches probably pushing it for um, good results. This does require a, a significant amount of drilling effort because of the amount of holes. So it can be pretty costly from a drilling perspective. And the drilling needs to be really accurate because you're not using explosives to aid in the creation of a protective 
line like you would with a pre-split. Uh, so again, significant drilling, accurate drilling. So it's pretty high cost option that you could follow uh, for, for line drilling. And here's just a couple of pictures of, of what that might look like. Um, like I said, it's expensive, requires accurately, accurate drilling. Uh, in this case, or in these two images, the, the holes are drilled really close together. So you can imagine how much that would cost. And then here's just a diagram of the line drilling. So I've, I've just, it's a general diagram, right? So we've, we've got our line drilled holes that are two to four times hole diameter in white at the top there. And then our loaded blast holes, uh, you can tell, see how those would be arranged along the line. So you want them to be greater than or equal to half of the spacing um which is shown there at the bottom so again this is a rule of thumb it's a good place to start is this going to work in every geology or every scenario not necessarily but it's a good place to start okay so that's that's line drilling i've seen line drilling underground a lot uh you'll have a driller put put line drill holes in but that's usually where I see they they might not have the close enough spacing because they're still in a production mindset as well. Uh, where I've seen it work really well is in construction where they have to get good results. Um, and so they make sure to put the extra effort into the line drilling. Okay, next up is smooth wall blasting. And this is closely spaced and lightly loaded perimeter holes used to trim off rock damaged in underground tunnels. I've also seen this done in uh, surface quarries where they might shoot a production blast and then their last row, they, they have a, a roll of holes that they'll shoot after the production blast. Um, in that case, it might not even be timed in the same blast. It, it'll be a secondary blast. Underground in tunnels, they're all loaded in the same pattern and shot, um, but these parameter holes are shot at the end. So this is a really common thing to see in underground blasting. And the idea is that you trim off uh, the loose rock that's left behind from the production holes to give a relatively smoother profile. So you would have these holes drilled uh, closely spaced. Maybe you put a perimeter charge in it um, it could be a prepackaged charged or a uh, detonating cord product. And then that would fire at the last delay of the blast and trim off the worst overhanging rock or worst overblasted rock. And these blast holes should be lightly loaded um, or decoupled. And as I said, fired on the longest delay. So this is a nice diagram. I use the underground tunnel diagram for all of these examples, just for consistency. So you can see how one blast design might change for each, um, each method that's being used. So in this case, the approach I take is, is kind of a powder factor approach. So based on whatever powder factor works on your production holes, I would use that powder factor to calculate your spacing for your perimeter holes. Um, and I have the equation there. It's kind of small in the bottom corner, but basically all you're doing is, let's say you have a one meter by one meter pattern for your development round and you're using bulk emulsion. So you calculate the powder factor for, for one of those production holes. And then you, you plug that into this equation with your, your perimeter charging, whatever you use in, if it's prepackaged emulsion product, or a perimeter product or detonating cord. Um, and you can back calculate out what the burden and spacing need to be for the perimeter holes. So let's say you're using a third of the charge weight, then you're gonna wanna adjust your burden and spacing to make up for that. So those perimeter holes are gonna be tighter spaced. It might be uh, half a meter spacing or 0.3 meters spacing. And then the burden to the production holes might be a similar number as well. So you do have increased costs with this method with a uh, different type of product. You have to, you have to stock a different type of product. Um, the detonators are all the same, but 
the 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 actual product used for perimeter control would be would be something else other than the bulk explosive. They do have products now where you can where you can string load emulsion. Um, so in that case, you can use the same product throughout, but rather than a fully coupled charge on the perimeter with the emulsion, it's the hose is pulled out faster, so you get a, a string of emulsion along the bottom of the hole. Um, with you can also use, you know, accuracy of detonators makes a difference. So if you have some some electronic detonators, you might see an improved performance on the perimeter just because of the timing. Uh, with non-electric uh, delays, if those of you that are familiar with cap scatter, let's say you have a, a perimeter hole that's supposed to detonate at uh, 12 seconds or 12,000 milliseconds then it might actually detonate at 11,000 milliseconds or 12,500 milliseconds. So there's a lot of variation for when it actually detonates compared to when it's supposed to detonate. Whereas with electronic detonators, everything is very accurate and detonates exactly the time it's supposed to. Um, so you can have better results based on which products you choose. Something to keep in mind is that anytime you do change a product, uh, you want to reevaluate your design to make sure it's going to be adequate still. So let's say you change from detonating core, like a, a high strength detonating cord to a uh, small diameter emulsion um, chub that's detonator sensitive, then you'll want to check your equations because you might find that you can increase your spacing with uh, the higher charge weight. So uh, going on to buffer blasting. So this is similar to smooth wall. This just takes it one step further. So with buffer blasting, you have your perimeter holes that are very similar to um, the previous example I showed, but the holes next to them are also loaded a little lighter as well. So you're still trimming off the damaged rock um, to create a smoother profile with less damage and everything's timed at the end. So the, your perimeter holes are shooting at the end of the blast. Um, but you have a buffer row between your perimeter holes and your production holes. And this is kind of what that might look like. So this is the same design, but instead of, instead of all production holes with uh, decoupled perimeter charges. And what I mean by decoupled is the perimeter, let's say your holes are two inches in diameter or 50 millimeters. Decoupled means that your charge is going to be less than your hole diameter. So you have some air gap in there. So you might use a one inch charge or a 25 millimeter charge um, in a two inch or 50 millimeter hole. And that would be decoupled. Now the buffer holes are the orange ones in this diagram where you can see uh, but they're, they're located between the perimeter holes and the production holes, and they're lightly loaded with maybe a lower powder, um, a lower density product or a packaged product that's a larger diameter than your perimeter holes. So this is just kind of a, a scenario. So this, if you think back to the first scenario I showed, showed where everything had a similar uh, radial fracturing distance, in this one, your production holes fire, and then your buffer rows fire, and they have less fracture into the rock, and then your perimeter hole fires with less fracture. So in this example, you have a lot less fracturing back into your final high wall than you would with um, like a, a bulk blasting scenario or just a, um, a trim blast or something like that. So this one's this one you see a lot of underground. Um, but you can tell that there's still a problem where you're still getting fractures back beyond that final wall. And that's where pre-splitting comes in. So we will go to the pre-split. So uh, pre-splitting, I think, is one that a lot of people are familiar with. This creates a continuous fracture plane along the perimeter of the blast. And this prevents production holes from damaging the rock beyond it. So the idea is that you create a, a plane within the rock, almost like a joint, um, a man-made joint, if you will, 
and that stops the fracturing from extending beyond it if it's a good quality rock with a good quality pre-split. Uh, in this case, you're, you're actually detonating those pre-split holes before the blast. And it can be done in a, in a blast, in a, its own blast, or it can be done on like a zero delay or a short millisecond delay before the production holes fire. And just keys to this, just like anything else is good drilling control. Uh, good drilling accuracy, and the right product application. Okay, so here's our, our blast design again, but you can see in the timing, all the perimeter holes are timed on a zero delay. So again, I'm using an underground example here, but it's the same as the surface. So in our little example, if we zoom up on those same three holes again, we actually shoot those perimeter holes first and they create a nice fracture plane along the perimeter. And then we'll shoot the production holes out. And then if there's buffer holes or more production holes, they'll, the fractures stop along the pre-split if it's designed correctly. So here's some rules of thumb for pre-split blasting. And obviously this is, these are rules of thumb, right? So this is a place to start. You might find that whatever explosives products you have or whatever geology you have, you have a, a values that perform better than this, but this should get you a good start. Um, so for hole spacing, a good starting point is 10 times the hole diameter. So let's say you have a three inch hole, um, you'd be looking at 30 inches of spacing. Hole diameter, typically good results are obtained from one and a half to four inches underground and up to six inches for vertical holes. I know a lot of surface metals mines can't go that small and blast maybe eight, nine inch diameter uh, pre-split holes. And you can still get okay results. You just have to um, account for the fact that it's a larger hole diameter. And if, if you want, um, really good results, you might have to space the holes closer and use a small diameter charge or something to still get similar results. Because uh, the bigger you go, the more chance you have to damage the rock um, and the less precise you are. So a good uh, starting point for the charge diameter is 25% of the hole diameter or one quarter of the hole diameter. So if you're four inch holes, a good starting point for your charge is, is one inch. Um, that's easy for vertical holes, like for surface blasting. For underground developing bla development blasting, that's pretty hard to do. You can't really get too many products other than detonating cord at a smaller diameter, like a half inch or three quarter inch diameter. So you have to basically make some make some adjustments to where maybe the results aren't aren't perfect by the book. Uh, for example, I worked with a mine in Michigan um, where they, they wanted to do pre-splitting. It was a cut and fill underground mine. And they were doing, some of the drillers were doing what they thought was line drilling. The holes weren't quite close enough together. They were, they had perimeter product, but they were using it as more of like um, a smooth wall blast where they were shooting everything late. Uh, and what, what we did was, we wanted to look at the improvement, the possible improvements that pre-splitting could do underground without bringing in any new technology or different products. So we used non-electric delays, but the detonators they had didn't have a pyrotechnic delay element. So there's no cap scatter with the zero delay. So everything was shot on a zero delay on the perimeter. Um, they found operation wise that using a quarter inch product like a large grain deck cord was expensive and difficult to get. The operation preferred using a small diameter prepackaged product that where the hole was traced with a, a small grain deck cord to make sure that all the product fired. And they, they, um, they put a birdie in the end of the hole to keep the product in. And even though the charge was 
probably half the hole diameter. So rather than 25%, the charge was about 50% of the hole diameter. Their results after shooting a number of baseline blasts and pre-split blasts, the results showed that they were able to reduce their overbreak significantly enough that they they estimated that they saved overall five to ten percent of their mining cost, which is pretty significant for a cut and fill operation where everything is is mined and backfilled with cement. So if you're overbreaking um, and mucking out cement backfill and then rebackfilling, the cost just escalates. Uh, so, so they found that even though their their pre-split results weren't perfect, it still saved them a lot of money by doing it. So um, that's just a good point to make with this is that even though you might not follow the rules of thumb precisely, uh, even if you follow some of the, the general guidelines and make it work for your operation without increasing the work for the, the blasters, without increasing the, the cost significantly, you can still improve your results. Uh, on to the last one, and this is an interesting one that I haven't really seen. I actually haven't seen uh, myself in the field, and it's not really caught on anywhere that I'm aware. Maybe there's some specialty construction projects, but it's called a fracture control technique. And in this, when you drill the holes, you actually notch the holes to kind of start the pre-split fracture so that the pre-split plane basically goes along where you notch the holes. Uh, so it helps direct the pre-split plane along the perimeter. Uh, and you can use mechanically created notches, whether that's with a tool on the drill or a water jet uh, attachment, you can create the um, uh, notches in the holes. And then once they're notched, you put light charges in, just similar to any other pre-split, and um, get pretty good results. So here's kind of a picture of uh, fracture control technique and the image on the uh, top left would be the an example of like a tool that you might have with a drill bit. The central, center image would be like a water jet cut to start it. So you can see notching a hole like that's really gonna start the pre-split so you can get by with a lot lighter charge. And then the far right picture would be like results uh, in a sandstone and what that looks like. Okay, that's the the methods anyway. Ravi, do you want to throw up the last poll? Yeah, this is a poll number four. If everybody can take a few seconds. While you're throwing up the poll, I saw somebody put, uh, what should the depth of the pre-split holes be? Uh, it's a good question. You, you want to keep the depth of the holes within a tolerance where you can drill them accurately. So that's one point. Um, underground, obviously, in development rounds, the pre-split, anywhere I've seen it, it's drilled the full length of the round. Um, surface mining. Typically, it's the blast depth, maybe a little deeper into the sub drill uh, to make sure that pre-split breaks all the way. I've seen where you have larger diameter holes, uh, one good method is to maybe you have three short benches, but you can pre-split, you can drill accurately uh, three bench. Let's say, let's say you mine in 10 meter benches and you can drill accurately 30 meters. So you could pre-split. 30 meters or three bench worths, and then blast up to that pre-split with each bench. Uh, but you just have to be careful that you don't um, damage the pre-split as you get down to the bottom bench. So I'll close the poll here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got. Results vary, sometimes great, sometimes not. This seems to be the most and then kind of results were okay, but not great. So not many, not many perfect ones. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with geology and some of those external factors. 
uh, which which I'll touch on briefly. But again, just because of the time and everything, I can't get into a lot of the details. But the information is out there um, on on the details of how some of the external factors affect results. And while I'm on the topic, somebody asked about how the notches are created. Um, so I can't zoom into this, but it's either a mechanical tool on the drill steel. Um, personally, I've not seen it done, so I don't know exactly how the tooling is created. Um, but the another option, especially if you're in sandstone or something where you can use a water jet tool, they, they developed a water jet tool where you can notch the holes uh, with, a, with a very high pressure water jet. So either a mechanic, I think a mechanical notch would probably be um, more common if you were to see this. I know there's some papers out there that, that you can look up. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, onemine.org, so that's O-N-E-M-I-N-E.org, has a lot of research papers from different organizations. And that's a good place to look for more information on uh, this method if it's of interest. Or you can talk to me. I have a couple papers on it that I've found and I'm happy to share. Okay. So that's that's kind of the, the perimeter control techniques that I was talking about today. I'll briefly cover the external impacts next and then just kind of summarize everything and then we'll have time for maybe five or 10 minutes of questions. Uh, Bill, I just saw your question. So. Um, if I'm right, the notch tool is free from the steel, so it goes straight in while the steel's rotating. The water jet tool, if I'm right, is a you drill the holes and then the water jet tool is used after the holes are drilled. So it's manual and, and that's how like, you keep the notch in the direction you want. Okay, so I'm going to cover four different external impacts. Structural geology is a big one. Drilling accuracy is a big one. Um, stemming more for the, the collar zone if you have overbreak of the collar, and then the, the charge itself. Um, and water goes in this too. So really just geology and, and water play can play havoc with blast results. Uh, here's some pictures. The top left shows like good results. Um, you know, limestones probably seems to be the, in, in my experience, limestone is the easiest one to get good results because typically, at least where I'm from in, this, in the US, a lot of limestone's horizontally bedded. Um, it's competent. So when you have nice competent rock like that, you can get pretty good pre-split results. The jointing can wreak havoc though. If you have a lot of uh, jointing, uh, let's say 45 degrees to the pre-split or less, 30 degrees to the pre-split, um, one of the first things I do when I go to a site to help investigate pre-split performance is look at the structural geology. Because a pit is usually round, um, some parts of the pit are going to have jointing that's conducive to good pre-split results, and some parts of the pit are going to have jointing that's really bad, or it's going to have really poor rock for pre-splitting, uh, where it might not even be worth pre-splitting the rock. So like it might be hard to see, but this bottom left image shows a pre-split where the rock is parallel to the high wall. And if it's really close to a blast hole, even a pre-split hole, it's a, it's a path of least resistance. So the blast energy is going to fracture back to that joint. So if you have very well-defined jointing, and let's say the jointing's 30 degrees to the pre-split, so it's a small angle, um, those holes that intersect the joint are going to have a tendency to break back to that joint rather than along the high wall. Uh, in that case, you might need to have closer spaced holes with lighter charges to get past the joint. Um, so these are all things to watch out for, especially. Um, water in the holes, water couples the explosives, so explosive energy is transmitted into the rock. The point of decoupling is so that you lose a lot of the, the fracture energy or the shock energy into the air and it doesn't go into the rock. So it protects or it prevents the, the explosive from fracturing the rock significantly around the blast hole. 
if you have water, you're going to get a lot of radial fractures around the hole, even though you're pre-splitting and even though you're decoupled. So that's something else to be aware of if you're getting poor results, water could be the cause of that. Uh, impact of drilling accuracy. See, these are a couple of good results for pre-splitting, but you can see in the right picture, hopefully, how the holes start to deviate once they hit that second rock type there, the dark rock type. Um, so if if your hole is like a three inch hole with three foot spacing, then imagine if you deviate half a foot, which is pretty easy to do, or your drill's not aligned by half a foot. Just by doing that, you might have holes that, that deviate so they're four feet apart. Uh, and that can cause some issues with the results as well. So that just shows how important drilling accuracy is. To, so if, if, if you're pre-splitting and everything needs to be pretty accurate, um, having those, having drilling accuracy issues can be a big factor in why your pre-splitting or perimeter control isn't working. And obviously this goes back to geology too, like different geo different um, rock types in your blast can cause drilling deviation as well. So like in this image, so you need to make sure that uh, your driller is aware of how important it is that he's drilling accurate holes. Okay, stimming is a good one. This is a cross section um, of of two pre-split charges. It's not a very good image, but the the magenta purple, or sorry, the purple or magenta line in that left image is like a pre-split, and then you can see the post blast profile where at the top of the bench it breaks back at 45 degrees, and this could be due to stemming or uh, sub drilling from the bench above. So even though the slide says the impact of stimming, um, some sub drilling can can affect your crest results of your pre split pattern as well. So two things here: if you want good crests, it's it's for your trim blast on the bench above. You should limit sub drill if you can. Uh, the other thing is with stemming: if you stem a pre split hole, it prevents a lot of high air blast issues which if you're close to houses or, um, you know, populated areas, you need that. But the stemming will prevent the pre-split fracture from traveling up and you might crater a bit at the top. So for the best performance, it's best to have that charge all the way up the hole. But again, the side effect of that is pretty high air blasts. Uh, the other thing with pre-splitting is you can have pretty high vibration results as well. So that's something to be aware of. Pre-splitting is very confined you're firing multiple charges on the same delay, uh, which that's just going to cause really high vibrations. So that's one of the downsides of using a pre-split and something to be aware of as well in populated areas. Okay, so the next is the impact of charge selection. You can see this is just a picture of some large diameter pre-split charges on the left. On the right, you can see where um, there's nice half barrels, but then there's a zone between two rounds where the, the pre-split stops and it's just, it looks like it was bulk blasted. And this could either be because the stimming zone wasn't charged, but more likely the toe, they had toe charges that were fully coupled and that caused the, the back break in that area. So it's really important to understand that if you're going to double or triple up the bottom charge, the toe charge, or uh, use a larger diameter tow charge that it can have some effects on the, um, the final results of a uh, perimeter control technique. So that's just a brief coverage of the external impacts. And just to summarize, this is a nice chart. This was developed at the University of Missouri Rolla, which is now uh, called Missouri University of Science and Technology. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, Dr. Paul Worsey did a paper back in the 80s where he evaluated different techniques of perimeter control in their underground research facility. And uh, basically what he found was in this instance, and these are very small scale development rounds in limestone, but the depth of disturbance relative to each method is really interesting to me. 
Uh, the bolt blast had over a meter and a half between, so about 1.7 meters of uh, fracturing back into the rock. The smooth walling, which is your standard underground um, blast design, where you use a lightly loaded perimeter charge but fire it at the end of the blast, um, dropped that damage to about a meter or 1.1 meters. So you can see that there's definitely improvement by doing that. Uh, interestingly enough, there's they they had a bedding plane in a couple of their blasts. So they were able to determine how a bedding plane. Uh, did to prevent depth of the disturbance. And it actually stopped. It does a good job of stopping fracture, which is why you see um, bedding planes or joints in blasts a lot of times where the, the rock breaks back to a bedding plane or a joint and then stops there. It basically acts like its own pre-split. So in this case, it dropped the depth of disturbance to 0.7, which is a little less than half of a bulk blast. Pre-splitting was pretty similar to that, maybe a little less in this case. And then fracture control is the best by far and drop the depth of the disturbance to 0.2 meters, uh, which is quite significant. So you can see where, where pre-splitting can, can bring uh, really good results. I had, like I said, I haven't had the opportunity to use something like fracture control, which is, those are the notches that you mechanically create for the holes to start uh, the split. Uh, but if you're ever in that situation, that has the best results. So just to go back through and just review what we covered, uh, one was understanding different perimeter control techniques. So we covered that. Uh, we covered uh, the pros and cons of each technique and kind of what, uh, how, they're, how they're done. So you have the ability to select between those and you're prepared to be aware of the factors that affect uh, the perimeter control result. Now, I didn't go into what are the steps, you know, all the steps you can take depending on the different environmental factors, because that would be um, a couple hours worth of discussions, I think. But we at least covered them and uh, briefly and talked about different factors. So if you do have poor results, take a look at the geology, take a look at the groundwater, um, the charge selection, and those other factors just to make sure that there might not be something outside influencing that. And that could be why you might have a really good pre-split result and then you move to another part of the mine with the exact same design and the results are just no good. And that could be why it's just the influence of geology. And we kind of covered how to adjust design parameters to achieve desired results and what design parameters are important, like the charge diameter, the hole diameter and the spacing. Uh, drilling accuracy. So, uh, Ravi, you want to throw up the last poll? Absolutely. So, this poll is just at the end uh, to see how, uh, if there is any other topic anybody would like to kind of know about uh, related to uh, today's session. So, if you can take. Yeah, uh, yeah I asked. Uh, this is something Robbie suggested, and I, I like the idea because anytime you do a presentation like this, it's always good to get feedback from everyone involved and understand, you know, okay, what what could I focus on more the next time that we might not have focused on much on this time. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Nathan, for an uh, amazing uh, session today. Uh, I learned a lot, you know, it's essentially, I, I thought the pre-splitting and the perimeter control, we had a lot of safety factors to it, but uh, the uh, there are several kind of, you know, ideas here about how it can operationally benefit and reduce the cost as well, which is uh, uh, pretty kind of uh, insightful here. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for doing the today's uh, presentation. I hope for the audience, we, um, they got a lot of value here. Uh, we do have a time for a uh, few questions here, so I'll uh, I'll begin. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions, we will respond over emails. Um, so in the interest of time, we do have a lot of questions. I will begin uh, some of the questions which are uh, have a high votes here. Uh, so starting with uh, a <clears throat> question here. Uh, do you use techniques post loss to verify the level of success or the effectiveness of the wall control blast? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, 
one of the like if you're pre-splitting one one method you can use is is counting percentage of half barrels um just because you don't have half barrels doesn't mean you have uh, bad results but that's that's a pretty quick and dirty way of checking the the results so let's say you have 50 percent half barrels that might mean that your production holes are too close to the pre-split and you need to back them off a little bit it might mean that your pre-split holes are too far apart and you need to bring them closer together. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Uh, the study that I showed on this slide here, they used a seis seismic refractivity surveys. And what that's, um, that's a pretty in-depth method. It's not something I've had the opportunity yet to do. That's more of a, on the research side of things. But in that, you actually um, basically measure the, the the speed of vibrations through the rock along the perimeter and the slower the speed or you, you know you time the, the let's say you, you hit the wall with a hammer and you have a couple of, of vibration monitors at high sample rates at distance you can actually measure the thickness of the fracture based on the refractivity of the the rock so the fractured rock the vibration that you create moves slower than it will once the vibration reaches the, the solid rock. And then you can kind of do some math uh, to determine what the thickness is. So that's an option. Um, I suppose you might be able to try coring into it and do rock tests. So my thought is like um, if, if you have an area where you do, where you do pre-splitting or some perimeter control technique, and then an area where you just do production blast and you core into the wall, you could probably test that core to determine where it starts to get back up to its in situ strength uh, to know exactly how far the fractures are. Uh, so those are maybe a couple methods you could look at. Great, thank you, Nathan. Uh, the other question here is, are there rules of thumb for pre-splitting in uh, non-competent uh, rock geology? Yeah, I mean, I normally uh, the the way I go is is smaller scale, smaller diameter holes, smaller charges. Um, if if your rock's not competent, in some cases you just might not get good results. Or to get good results, you're going to have to do something that's just not operationally viable. So you might have to do very small diameter holes um, with small deck cord charges or something like that to get good results. Um, it's all a scale thing, right? So that's something to look at, though, is if you're getting bad results, uh, it could just be, let's say you're a surface metals mine and you only can go down to a nine inch or an eight inch diameter blast hole. That could be your reason is, is you're just trying to do perimeter control with too large a scale of diameter and charges. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Um... We have just one last question we will do here since we are running on top of the hour. Uh, and this is an interesting question that I, you know, I, I see because there is no good way to measure the success. But I think the question here is, uh, how would you measure the success of final wall blasting uh, and parameter control? Uh, is there any KPIs kind of are built in around here? Um, KPIs for measuring the success? Yes. Yeah, I mean, other than other than like the direct measurement methods we kind of mentioned about like how much it protects the wall. Um, the biggest thing I look at, and, and it's kind of a, um, you hear it a lot now, is kind of a drill to mill analysis. Like the biggest thing for me is ultimately, um, other than safety, you know, there's no cost to safety. Ultimately, what is the overall operational cost impact by implementing a perimeter control method? So um, in the case, in, in like the case of the example I used in Michigan, we, um, we looked at the cost of drill, we looked at the explosive cost, but then we looked downstream at the overbreak percentage um, and how much more material you have to muck from each blast and how much more backfilling you have to do with cement backfill. Um, how much more bolts, how much more mesh, how much more shotcrete if you use shotcrete. So all these impacts downstream, the impact of dilution on the ore. I think all of this stuff, ultimately, like if you had your pie in the sky of, 
um, the KPIs, like that's really what it's all about is the overall operational costs impact and, and how you can save money um, operationally. So awesome. if, if that's the last question, I'm going to put one plug in, Robbie. Um, yeah. We, uh, if you guys are around and interested in this type of material and um, this type of training, we are scheduling a, a drill and blast training in Elko, Nevada, June 20 through 22nd. It'll be the, the, the main uh, lecturers are going to be myself, Dr. Paul Wersey, who's retired professor from Missouri S&T. And we'll have some guest speakers from Sandvik um, and Westco, um, which is an explosive provider in the region. So it should be a really interesting training. It, day one will be foundational. Day two is going to be sur advanced surface. And day three is going to be advanced underground. So if you're interested in that sometime in the next few days, I'm going to have more information up on the website. But that link there, you can look at that. It has some basics on it already. And then we'll have actual tickets. Um, so if, if you're interested or know anyone that's interested, uh, feel free to, to reach out. My email is also on there if you have any questions um, or any details that we didn't cover. Happy to share. Great. Yes, please do reach out to Nathan. Uh, I'm pretty sure this will be an amazing training and opportunity for everybody uh, uh, here who is interested in learning furthermore um, on the surface and underground operations here. Uh, Nathan, thank you very much for uh, today's session. This has been amazing. A uh, lot of interesting uh, content as well as insightful and uh, that uh, I believe everybody can apply it uh, operationally in their uh, uh, drill and blast, you know, either underground or surface uh, operations here. Uh, everybody who has attended, yeah. Nathan? Oh, sorry, Robbie. I was just going to say, I think I saw a few comments out of the corner of my eye. You know, there's other things you can do. Um, I covered really main high level perimeter control. There's probably other things out there that you've seen and stuff. So this not, might not necessarily be the end all be all. If you do have interesting methods or something that, that you think I missed or didn't touch on, please feel free to share. I'd love to add them to this to make it more comprehensive if, if there was anything that was missed. No, oh, yeah, absolutely learning, continuous learning. Uh, yeah, and for, for the everybody who's attended, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. We're very, very grateful that you took uh, an hour today uh, to spend with us, uh, so appreciate that. If you have further questions, you know, please reach out uh, to Nathan or reach out to us. We'll be happy to kind of answer that. Uh, and if there is any other specific topic you are interested in learning, please also suggest and reach out to us. Uh, until the next time, thank you very much uh, and goodbye. Yep, thanks everyone.